Wait, okay. Uh, there we go. Uh, so, all right. Um, so, uh, constraint satisfaction problems and reinforcement learning. This is our fifth class. Um, so, what is a constraint satisfaction problem? Uh, a constraint satisfaction problem, or a CSP, consists of a set of variables, a domain for each variable, and a set of constraints. And the aim is to choose a value for each variable so that the resulting possible world satisfies the constraints. We want a model of constraints. A finite CSP has a finite set of variables and a finite domain for each variable. Many of the methods considered in this, uh, <laughs> in this only work for finite CSPs. Although some are designed for infinite, even continuous domains. The multidimensional aspects of these problems or each variable can be seen as a separate dimension, makes them difficult to solve, but also provides structure that can be exploited. Uh, given a CSP, there are a number of tasks that can be performed. You can determine whether or not there is a model, find a model, find all of the models, or enumerate the models, count the number of the models, determine whether some statements hold in all the models, and stuff like that. Uh, constraint satisfaction problems are mathematical questions defined as a set of objects whose statements satisfy a number of constraints or limitations. CSPs represent the entities in a problem as a homogeneous collection of finite constraints uh, over variables, which is solved by a constraint satisfaction method. Uh, examples of problems that can be models of constraint satisfaction problems include like type inference problems, eight queens puzzle, map coloring problem, Sudoku, crosswords, uh, stuff like that. And a lot of other logic puzzles. Um, so here is a video about constraint satisfaction problems. Can you guys hear that or? Okay. Uh... Action problem. In this presentation, I'm going to introduce constraint satisfaction problems. These are used in artificial intelligence when you need to make a bunch of decisions in parallel and you can model those decisions using variables. So in a constraint satisfaction problem, we have a number of variables, x1, x2, x3, up to xn here, and every variable has a number of choices that you can make for the value of that variable. And we call that the domain. So here we see x1 can have the value 1, 2, 3, or 4. That's called its domain. We also have a set of constraints. And the constraints are the things that don't allow you to assign some of the values to the variables. So for example, a simple constraint could simply be x1 cannot have the value 3. That's called a unary constraint because it only involves a single variable. We can deal with those very easily by simply removing that value from the domain of the variable. But we also have binary constraints. Those involve two variables. So for example, here we have x3 must be greater than x4. And what we have to do with the problem is that we have to find a consistent set of values for all of our variables so that none of these constraints are broken. So what we're looking for is a solution. A solution assigns a value to each variable such that none of the constraints are broken. The simplest algorithm that we can use to solve the problem, not the best algorithm, but the simplest, is known as backtracking. And I'm going to illustrate that process on this problem here. So we have three variables, A, B, and C. 
The domains of these variables are the values 1, 2 and 3. In general, you're allowed to have different domains for different variables. It just happens here that I've got the same domain for each of my variables. Here are my constraints. A must be greater than B. B is not allowed to be equal to C. And A is not allowed to be equal to C. So I can solve this problem by a simple process whereby I go through all of the possible values, one at a time, and then if I reach an assignment of values that breaks the constraints, I backtrack. I backtrack to the last decision that I made and I try another value. Let's see how this works. So I'll start with A. I've got to assign a value to A, and the first value that I can assign is 1. So I'm going to try that first. This is known as a partial assignment. So it says A is 1, but I don't know the values for B and C yet. I now need to look at this partial assignment and see if it fits with my constraints. A is greater than B. Well, I don't know what B is yet, so that's OK. B is not equal to C. I don't know B or C. That's OK. A is not equal to C. Well, C doesn't have a value. So all of these constraints are OK at the moment. But then I don't know much about the problem so far. I've only got one value for one variable. So now I move on to B. And the backtracking algorithm is systematic. It goes through all of the values in turn, left to right. So we start with B is equal to 1. We've now got a partial assignment with two values in it, and we check them against this constraint. So let's look now. A is greater than B. Ah, that's broken. A is not greater than B here. So therefore, that's not a possible assignment of those values. And therefore, I have to backtrack. So I backtrack on the last decision that I made, and I try another value for B. And I just take them systematically left to right. Now you notice that the algorithm isn't being particularly um, intelligent at this point because it's trying greater values. It's systematic, as I said. So A equals 1, B equals 2. Well, that breaks that constraint as well. A equals 1. B equals 3 is the next one after the backtrack. That's no good as well. So at this point, we've tried all the possible values for B. We can't backtrack onto another value. So we need to go back to A and backtrack on that. So we now try a different value for A. We've tried that one and we found that we can't have a value for B. So now we're going to try that one. So A equals 2. That's OK. A greater than B, B not equal to C, A not equal to C, that's fine. So we now move on to B and try the values one at a time. Notice that we go back to B equals 1 because we've got a new value for A. So A equals 2, B equals 1. Well, A is greater than B, that's OK. B is not equal to C, well, we don't know what C is, so that's OK. A is not equal to C, again, we don't know what C is. So that's OK. So we're happy with this and we can now move on to C. And we try the first value for C. C is equal to 1. A is 2, B equals 1, C equals 1. Well, A equals 2, B equals 1. Well, that one's OK. B is not equal to C. Ah, it is. So this one is no good and we have to backtrack. So we backtrack on the last thing that we did, C equals 1, and we backtrack to a second value. A equals 2, B equals 1, C is equal to 2. That's okay for this. A is indeed greater than B. B is not equal to C. That's okay. A is not equal to C. Ah. So that one's no good because that constraint is broken. We now backtrack again here. A is equal to 2, B is equal to 1, C is equal to 3. Check the constraints, that's OK, that's OK, and now that's OK because A and C have different values. So that is the complete solution found by backtracking. Yeah, I'm going to call
All right, so does everyone sort of get the idea about CSPs from watching that video? I think an important thing to note is that it's systematic. So even though you could probably just like by using logic, you can tell that A can't be one. So none of like the first, where does he start writing? Like all of these things that he wrote out, none of them would have worked. And even though he went higher with B, even though it didn't make sense to, it's systematic. So we have to like check all those first and then we keep going. And then that's also how we know that this is our final answer. And it's not something like uh, A is three, B is two, C is one, because this is the first one that we come up with when you do all that. Um, I also have a second video here. My name is Deepak Himani and I work in the Department of Computer Science, IIT Madras. And I'm here to introduce my short course, which is a 20 hour course on constraint satisfaction problems. And I hope this will motivate you to come please or register for this course. Okay, so let me just give you a very brief introduction to CSPs or constraint satisfaction problems as we call them. These are representations where the problems are formulated as a set of constraints between a set of variables. And formally, we say that there are, it's a triple. So x is a set of variables, d is a set of domains, one for each variable. And c is a set of constraints, where each constraint is a relation or, over a subset of the variables, essentially. So an example should help that. Now, many problems can be posed as constraint satisfaction problems, which means that a user has to focus only on solving, on formulating the problem as a CSP. And the solving part can be handled by an off-the-shelf CSP solver which is what we will try to look at in this course as to what, how do you develop these solvers essentially. Now, CSPs are in, important or, and interesting particularly because they allow us to combine search and reasoning together. So in, in the problem solving using search, we did only search. In knowledge representation, we did only reasoning. But here we can do a combination of two. So let's look at a couple of examples and see how that is happening. So one example is the N Queens problem, which is a well-known problem where in this instance of the problem, it's a six queen problem. There are six queens you have to place on a six by six chessboard. The queens are Q1 to Q6. And the values that these variables can take are the column numbers A, B, C, D, E, F. And the constraints are that no queens can be on the same column or on the same diagonal, essentially. Now, searching would simply say try queen one on, on column A, then try queen two on column B or something and this kind of thing. But the moment you place queen one on column A, as you can see on the figure on the left hand side, you know that you can't place queen two on column A or B, you can only place it on column three. So this is some reasoning which is being combined with search. And on the right hand side figure, you can see that after you have placed four queens, then there's no place left for six, queen number six, so you might as well backtrack from this place itself. Here's another example where constraint propagation uh, has been used effectively. So there are these two, the, these line drawings which have to be labeled uh, with uh, each edge has to be labeled with one of four different possible labels that whether it is convex or concave or whether it's an edge where the material is on one side. And you can see on the two figures that on the left hand side we have a convex filled cube in red, whereas on the right hand side we have a concave hollow cube in red. The, the, the red figures are the same, it's just that the labeling is different. And CSP allows us to handle this problem effectively. Lastly, let me introduce this thing called crypto arithmetic puzzles, where you have this uh, puzzle which says send plus more should be equal to money. And wh what we mean is that if you substitute values from 0 to 9 for S, E, N, D, M, O, R, E, and so on, it must work out that the arithmetic is proper, essentially. So the constraints comes from arithmetic and the fact that each letter must have a distinct value. And then we have four hidden variables, C1, C2, C3, C4, essentially, which are the carries that you would do if you were doing addition. 
Now you can see that you can immediately start some reasoning instead of just doing blind search. You can say that this this most significant bit m must be one, and because the carry can at most be one, and this already you have part of the solution here. And then next you can reason that the next significant bit o cannot be one because already m is one, and it cannot be two because then you know the carry c3 can only be one, and s s can be at most nine, so o must be zero. And in this fashion you can continue reasoning and combining it with search. And I will leave it. for you to complete this problem and hopefully come and join this course on constraint satisfaction all right so that was the second video um i think the main part that you guys need to understand is probably just the first slide to be honest so this is just an introductory course uh so <laughs> uh so they're formally triples and just like how we talked about before they're like there's a set of variables the set of domains and a set of constraints um so just like in the example that this guy was using uh the variables would be a b and c and then the domains that would be the 1 2 3 1 2 3 1 2 3 and the constraints would be the things like a has to be greater than b or b can't be equal to c a can't be equal to c and then that's how we get something later uh so that's the first thing we have to talk about today the second thing is reinforcement learning and we kind of put over this like way back in the first class we were talking about uh i think the limited memory ai we we're talking about uh how uh if you guys remember the video with the people playing hide and seek you know how they sort of remember things from past rounds and use that to make themselves smarter sort of like that um so reinforcement learning is the training of machine learning models to make the sequence of decisions the agent learns to achieve a goal in an uncertain potentially complex environment and reinforcement learning and artificial intelligence faces a game like situation its goal is to maximize the total reward reinforcement learning is a special branch of ai algorithms algorithms that is composed of three key elements an environment agents and rewards in the paper the researchers provide several examples that show how reinforcement learning agents were able to learn general skills in games and robotic environments uh so there are four types of reinforcement learning there's positive reinforcement uh which is to find as an event that occurs because of specific behavior it increases the strength and the frequency of the behavior and impacts positively on the action taken by the agent this type of reinforcement helps you see, helps you to maximize performance and sustain change for a more extended period however too much reinforcement may lead to over optimization of state which can affect the results there is negative reinforcement which is defined as strengthening of behavior that occurs because of a negative condition which should have which should have been stopped or avoided it helps you to define the minimum standard of performance however the drawback of this method is that it provides enough to meet up the minimum behavior uh punishment which is where the agent is rewarded for correct moves and punished for the wrong ones and extinction which is when a response is no longer reinforced following a discriminative stimulus uh so if you can go back here here's some videos about it uh so watch this one first after we watch an ad I'm Jabril and welcome to Crash Course AI Say I want to get a cookie from a jar that's on a tall shelf. There isn't one right way to get the cookies. Maybe I find a ladder or use a lasso or build a complicated system of pulleys. These could all be brilliant or terrible ideas. But if something works, I get the sweet taste of victory and I learned that doing the same thing could get me another cookie in the future. We learned lots of things by trial and error, and this kind of learning by doing to achieve complicated goals is called reinforcement learning.
So far, we've talked about two types of learning in Crash Course AI. Supervised learning, where a teacher gives an AI answers to learn from, and unsupervised learning, where an AI tries to find patterns in the world. Reinforcement learning is particularly useful for situations where we want to train AIs to have certain skills we don't fully understand ourselves. For example, I'm pretty good at walking, but trying to explain the process of walking is kind of difficult. What angle should your femur be relative to your foot? And should you move it with the average angular velocity of... Yeah, never mind. It's really difficult. With reinforcement learning, we can train AIs to perform complicated tasks. But unlike other techniques, we only have to tell them at the very end of the task if they succeeded, and then ask them to tell us how well they did. We're going to focus on this general case, but sometimes this feedback could come earlier. So if we want an AI to learn to walk, we give them a reward if they're both standing up and moving forward, and then figure out what steps they took to get to that point. The longer the AI stands up and moves forward, the longer it's walking, and the more reward it gets. So you can kind of see how the key to reinforcement learning is just trial and error over and over again. For humans, a reward might be a cookie or the joy of winning a board game. But for an AI system, a reward is just a small positive signal that basically tells it, good job, and do that again. Google DeepMind got some pretty impressive results when they used reinforcement learning to teach virtual AI systems to walk, jump, and even duck under obstacles. It looks kind of silly, but works pretty well. Other researchers have even helped real-life robots learn to walk. Seeing the end result is pretty fun and can help us understand the goals of reinforcement learning. But to really understand how reinforcement learning works, we have to learn new language to talk about these AI and what they're doing. Similar to previous episodes, we have an AI, or agent, that is our loyal subject that's going to learn. An agent makes predictions or performs actions, like moving a tiny bit forward or picking the next best move in a game and it performs actions based on its current Hello?